Thanks, everyone, and welcome back. I'm so delighted to um, be introducing part two of our program with um, Jim and Bill Moran from Hamilton Wood Type. Um, and for those of you who are here with us last week, I think they really need no introduction, but I will go ahead and introduce them anyway. Jim Moran is director of the Hamilton Wood Type Museum. He has studied and contributed to the art and craft of print for more than 35 years. He leads letterpress workshops, archives the collection, and maintains the museum on a daily basis. Bill Moran is also a third generation letterpress printer and graphic designer. He teaches printing at the University of Minnesota and is the author of Hamilton Wood Type, A History in Headlines. He is the former artistic director of the Hamilton Wood Type Museum. So um, today, um, Bill and Jim are going to talk a little bit about making wood type and printing with wood type and about the um, legacy project, legacy type project. And um, for those of you who are interested, I'm going to put a link in the chat so you can go to the page and see more of what they're talking about today. But with that, I will turn it over to Bill and Jim. So welcome and thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good, yeah, good afternoon. Thanks, Jill, um, and everyone else. It's nice to be here, nice to be back. Um, I, Bill, I'm going to let you take lead on this one because, well, you started it. <laughs> no, you started it. <laughs> Don't get me started. Uh, yet, so glad to see such a nice turnout today. Thanks to the team at the Newberry for letting us talk about type in the Midwest. Um, we, uh, when we uh, originally conceived of the project, it was called Slinging Ink, but now that it's a virtual event, we, uh, uh, we're slinging pixels. So that's the next best thing. And I'll be shouting out to Elizabeth to advance the slides. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, I, was, I came across this term um, and I really like it. It goes back to the 1600s. And um, it's just gadzooks, you're surprised. And I discovered there's a typographic connection and uh, it's a kind of ligature, which I'll be showing you in just a second. But we're thrilled to be here, surprised that people are so still so interested in letterpress printing, both historically and on a contemporary mm -hmm. basis. And let's jump in. Go ahead, next slide. So um, in 2009, um, we began a program called the Wood Type Legacy Project, and it's a collaboration between the museum and internationally known type designers to make contemporary type. We were interested in new type designs, and so our goal was to be able to do two things with them, cut the type, three things, cut the type, print the type, and then also have a digital font that people could take a little piece of the museum away with them mm -hmm. uh, and have it on your desktop. And so it's become a really successful program for us. Our partner on this project is the P22 Type Foundry. Richard Kegler runs that, and we're so thrilled to have uh, such a talented type designer working on the digital side of this project. Next slide. So my big inspiration for this project was the venerable Susanna Lichko and her Mrs. Eves typeface. So Mrs. Eves, if you, and those of you who don't know the backstory, she was John Baskerville's widow. And uh, she took on the running of the company after Baskerville died. And she really was a heroine and an important, uh, an unsung heroine of type design. And so uh, when I heard about this project and this backstory, I thought um, we should do the same thing at Hamilton. There's so many people behind the scenes over the years, the decades, the centuries that made Hamilton possible that we wanted to start showcasing some of them. Okay, for the type nerds in there, you see that ligature between the S and the T in nasturtium? Now, yeah, that is a gadzook for you type nerds out there. That little connecting bar is referred to as a gadzook. And so uh, next slide. <clears throat> what does it mean? Oh, uh, well, it's religious. It's an abbreviation of the word God's hooks, which is another name for the nails that they nailed Christ to the cross with. <clears throat> wow. Sorry, I asked. Well, it's wood and, and it's the type of wood. So wood type type. Yeah. Anyway, the first project that we um, 
that we embarked on was with uh, none other than Matthew Carter, who gave a wonderful talk with the Newberry a couple of weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And so Matthew had never done a typeface in wood before. He worked in metal, he worked in digital, uh, but never in wood. And so he was challenged by our mutual friend, uh, Richard Zoft, to create a font in wood. And he agreed to do that. Um, he had begun uh, uh, work on this typeface and he chose to do it as a chromatic font. Next slide, please. And what you see here is a two color font and a poster made by Tracy Hahn. The important thing to talk about here is there's a positive and a negative version of this typeface. So that template on the right, that black A is the negative version of the letter A. And so you've got a surrounding portion of the typeface and you've got an interior portion of the typeface. And so on the left, you're looking at some of the examples of the type itself. And one of the things that we discovered at the museum was the cutting of templates for wood type is extremely, extremely demanding. And um, not just demanding to be accurate and precise about cutting those templates, but also when you're having a second color nest onto it, it's even more demanding. Next slide, please. And uh, if you don't mind my digressing for a moment, last week in the talk, we spoke a little bit about historic type and William Page as a type cutter that Hamilton eventually bought out was a master at chromatic types. And so we were looking at images from a type specimen book that the Newberry has in their collection, uh, which is the page chromatic fonts, which are stunning examples of chromatics done at their zenith, I would say. Yep, absolutely. So what you're looking at on this slide on the left is a CNC router, computer numerically controlled. That's what that CNC stands for. So we were doing some experiments trying to get a more accurate template and trying to cut type more accurately. And the image on the right shows you the positive version of the A, the negative version of the A, the C's and the R's. And as you can imagine, trying to get these things to fit together on the bed of a printing press, it's demanding for a printer, it's more demanding for a type cutter. Next slide. So what you see on this slide is some beginning proofs of the printed characters, the C, the A, and the R, and then some slight offsetting on that third row there where you can see a little bit of the white peeking through. And then on the very bottom, you have more of an offset. And what was really exciting and rewarding when working with Matthew is um, he uh, really liked these um, unpredictable results. And so that C, A, and R in the lower left-hand corner he was really pleased with this sort of stenciling effect that was taking place. On the right, you see a proper registration of the positive and negative, and you still have that tiny little line in between those blocks of the red. And so good printers, good type cutters are cutting this type in such a way that it makes it possible to really get these streamer typefaces as they're referred to, two color typefaces uh, to print properly. The thing that we didn't anticipate is not only do you have to cut the type very, very accurately so it nests properly, mm -hmm. you also have to put the letter in exactly the right place on the body of type. So when you spell C-A-R on the press bed if, with the positive version, and then you spell C-A-R with the negative version, they not only have to nest inside of each other, but they also have to be properly placed. And uh, so it was a challenge that uh, taught us a lot about type cutting. So we did some experiments using a, um, a scroll saw that we have here. We realized that it wasn't up to the task, or I should say that we as type cutters were not up to the task. So we started using CNC routing in order to make the templates. And then we would turn around and make the type using the pantograph from those digital templates. Next slide, please. Well, and one thing to, uh, to think about too, is that this uh, style of type is not merely a chromatic, it is what's referred to as a streamer font, and therefore it is intended to be used in that solid way that you see the proof. No spacing in between, in other words, no light space showing up uh, so that the type, if you will, has a streamer effect. 
And that also makes it incredibly hard to print accurately because you don't get to add spacing or reduce it in any way. If it isn't perfect, it does not work. One of the great things about taking on a project like this is we're working with one of the world's best type designers, taking on one of the most demanding projects for our first project. So um, <laughs> we learned a lot. I should also say that this typeface was named for Jim Van Lannen, one of the museum's founders. He's a board member of the Two Rivers Historical Society, really instrumental in getting the museum going. He really had a great vision. He and the rest of the Two Rivers Historical Society. Right. Next, next slide, please. So the next project that we took on was called named Arts for David Arts, who's there on the right. And we approached Eric Speakerman to design the typeface for us. And he said, yes, indeed, he would design the typeface. And then he said, I also want you to cut some of this type because um, I have a print shop in Berlin and I would like to use the um, I would like to use uh, this typeface in my shop. Dave Arts was a type trimmer at Hamilton. And if you want to go ahead and play that video, we've got a little clip of Dave trimming type here. So you start off with a pantograph. That letter L is cut on the pantograph. But then Dave has to go in and using type trimming tools to get all of those fine angles and all of those curves uh, sculpted out so that any blemishes, any imperfections that are in the type are going to be um, removed. You can see him there working at the trimming table here in the museum. He's got for reference, the uh, paper printed out, paper version of the font, so he can refer to that. But the skill involved with doing this kind of trimming, until you try to make good wood type, uh, you don't really appreciate uh, somebody with Dave's skills until you watch them work. Like a chef comes into a restaurant, Dave didn't use the type tools that we had on display. He brought his own trimming tools, uh, it's like a chef bringing a knife, his, their, his or her knives into the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back to the slideshow. I think one of the things that's also quite interesting about Dave is that he was not a volunteer at Hamilton. I had only heard his name referenced as a very good trimmer. And so he was still living uh, just outside of Two Rivers, maybe about 10 miles or so. So to bring him back was a very nice uh, uh, thing in terms of us getting to know somebody who did it so well and who was also interested in teaching it. Right, right. So Eric, also being an internationally recognized type designer, created this font and we cut the first version of it. We proofed it. And then we sent it off to Eric for comments. Well, Eric had a lot of comments, as you'll see in the following three slides, lots and lots and lots of production notes about where things should be in terms of crossbars, what kind of space he wanted in between the letters. We have side bearings that um, he wanted us to maintain, and just the way the radius of the curves work that all had to be perfect. One of the things we learned on this font is that because the type bit, the type cutting bit on the pantograph is turning um, clockwise, right. um, as it travels around different letters, if depending on the direction that the bit is turning, sometimes you'll get a slightly different radius. And that was an important discovery. It forced us to slow down and be more careful with how we were cutting curves, especially for someone as demanding as Eric. Right, Next generally. Slide. Generally speaking, the uh, router bit travels in the same direction that the um, uh, that the tracing is done. Right. So it needs to match. Right. And so the 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 pantograph operator has to make sure that they're always going the same direction around the template. Here you see me doing a preparing of half rounds of maple. These are cross sections of a maple tree. The museum has a lifetime supply, I think, of maple half rounds harvested in the early part of the 20th century. They have to be milled to 0.918 inches, exactly five coats of shellac with lots of um, sanding and buffing and steel wool in between. And uh, I think I had just read more of Eric's notes for changes and that's why the scowl is on my face because I'm not only being asphyxiated by shellac, but I'm also 
gritting my teeth because Eric's putting us through our paces. Again, a fantastic experience to work with a designer of Eric's caliber to be working on bringing, helping us bring our game up. Next slide. Um, I think it's important to note too that while American type is 0.918 inches tall, German type is not. And so even there, we were milling to a new uh, height, which I believe is 928, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, we had to source different kinds of uh, maple from different sources for this project. These letters are about six inches tall. And sometimes you can't get a whole letter out of a half round of wood. So we had to have some maple block glued up. And then we cut these um, in that way. It's important to say that the six inch tall letters had to be cut using, using CNC routers because our pantographs can't cut wood this big. We do have pantographs that historically did it, but we, they are not active pantographs. Most of what we do is under three inches. Is that fair to say? It is, it is. And it was also very common that when you got to a larger uh, piece, that, that it wasn't going to be a solid um, chunk of end grain wood, it was going to be glued up. And as it turns out, this is not a great example because this <laughs> is solid, but uh, typically when you reach about uh, five to six inches or 30 to 36 pikas tall uh, is when the shift from end grain to long grain would happen. Right, next slide. So we cut this typeface in three sizes, two inches tall, six inches tall, and 11 inches tall. And at each size, there were different technical requirements and limitations that we had. Here, you're looking at the 11 inch tall font. And we used MDF, medium density fiber board, and some fancy 3M adhesive to cut out the individual letters. And at the same time, the image on the right, we also laser etched, not just where the letter would go for reference, but also where you would cut the block of wood. One of the things that was really important to Eric was side bearings. That is how much space is to the left and the right of the letter on the block of type. And so at this height, we didn't have wood this big. We wanted to try a different technique. And so one eighth inch medium density fiber board then mounted on another piece of um, medium density fiber board and then cut on a table saw. Every letter being about 11 inches tall, six inches wide. Next slide, please. So here you see the ganged blocks of wood. Each of these planks is four feet long, which is what fit on a four by eight sheet of MDF. And you're, uh, I had to cut them out using a table saw. And then after the table saw work was done, you then used a disc sander to go up and essentially shave right up to that laser line. So you knew exactly where you needed to be. It was fun and terrifying. Mm -hmm. Next slide. <laughs> The next project we want to talk about is a border pattern project. Uh, Bernice Schwahert is, uh, was a type trimmer at Hamilton, the first woman hired at Hamilton as a type trimmer. And we tapped Marion Banches, the Vancouver-based uh, designer and illustrator, to produce this typeface for us. Uh, next slide, please. What we wanted to do is we wanted to use the type stamping machine or the border stamping machine, which you see on the left here, Jim talked about it a little bit last week. And on the right, you see the dies that are put in that stamping machine. And so we wanted to create a pattern. Uh, this is used to create border designs. And you combine these stamps on the right in various combinations in order to get really complex patterns. And so we wanted to put this machine back into use and um, we gave me charged Marion with the project of uh, creating a border design for us that would be interchangeable and makeable on the pantograph machine. Next slide, please. Not on the pantograph, on the stamping machine. This is what Marion came up with six glyphs. And at first glance, it seems really simple, but the really cool thing is when you combine them on the right, we've got Richard Kegler's uh, lockup, press lockup that includes examples of these borders. And what he did was he combined them in this lockup, knowing he was going to print them two or three times on top of each other in order to create a border. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what's possible with this 
with uh, letterpress printing. Again, a uh, specimen book that Rich Kegler was working on to showcase this border pattern. And um, it really reveals a kind of beauty and a flower-like quality that uh, just was a phenomenal example of, of border design. And uh, we were just blown away by Marion's work. You wanna show them what you just brought over? Sure, this is uh, preliminary proofs of the design. The truth is Hamilton didn't have anybody who had made borders, even among the volunteers. So we were at a bit of a loss to get the machine up and running the way it should be. Enter a guy from Marquette, Michigan named Dan Schneider, who was about to pursue his uh, final year as a master's candidate in industrial archeology. span He took the machine on as his subject, um, took it apart, put it back together again, and created uh, the ability for us to make borders again. And so this is the result of his work, which as you can imagine, must be incredibly precise. And so fortunately we are now again, able to make borders from that die stamping machine. Yep. Next slide, please. The other thing that was nice about the border as a digital font project is you could type away on your keyboard and render each of those six characters in different orientations, allowing you to build pattern upon pattern. Next slide. The next typeface that we wanna talk about is called Brilsky, named for Norbert Brilsky there on the right. Norb was a, uh, a Hamilton employee and uh, museum volunteer and absolutely instrumental in teaching us what we know today about, about uh, type cutting here at the museum. Elizabeth, you wanna play that next video? <clears throat> My name is uh, Norbert Brilski. And uh, I was born in Pulaski, Wisconsin, way back in 1924. My whole career at, um, at Hamilton, about 20 years it was, I, I, I stayed in a type shop and never worked in any other department and all that. My first job, this height machine, they call it, you know, where you prepare your wood. In fact, in make and type, the hardest work is preparing the wood. It isn't the cutting out, you know, with the panograph and all of that. My name is Bernice Schwahart. I grew up here in Two Rivers. I started in Hamilton in 19... 62, I believe it was. I uh, was not able to do heavy work, so they put me in the wood type, trimming. And I was the first woman trimmer they had. <laughs> so they couldn't get over with it. They hired a woman up there. <laughs> that was something to put a woman in a trimming. And then uh, Grace Kaler, she was packer, and she also says, you know that you were one of the best type trimmers we got here. She said, men are too sloppy. You're more fussy. I said, whoa, is that right? So that's good. She says, yeah, you can always tell when your type comes through. It's neat. I said, well, that's good. I like that. My name is Darlene Gilsdorf. I've lived in... You can hold up the video there. You know. 50 Thanks. Darlene's story is amazing, but we're keeping an eye on the clock and we've got a little more territory to cover. Let's go back to the slideshow. So um, Nick Sherman was tapped to design this typeface and this was a really wonderful homage to be able to do these typefaces 
uh, named for living living volunteers, people who in their lifetimes who probably thought they were never going to see uh, any recognition or acknowledgement for their work. It was such a joy to uh, name this project for Norbert. Mm-hmm. Um, happily, his daughter, Georgine Brilski, is now vo- a volunteer and a paid uh, part-time employee helping us cut wood. She learned, studied under her dad, and what a treat to be able to carry that legacy on. And even her daughter comes in and cuts type once in a while. She used to. So three generations of Brilskis in the museum helping us advance our mission. Next slide, please. So there's Norb at the pantograph. You kind of saw how that machine works in the video. Absolutely love this photo of Indiana University standing around Norb and in the 19, excuse me, 2008, 2009, he became kind of a rock star because he was featured so prominently in Justine Nagin's typeface film. So that was really quite right. a reward for us. Yeah. Next slide, please. Kurt Temkin uh, out of Chicago. Yep. Yep. More type in the Midwest. Mm-hmm. Here's a nice proof of it, an example of it. This is a reverse stressed Tuscan, bifurcated Tuscan. Reverse stress because the things that are normally thick on a typeface are thin. And the things that are normally thin, Nick, as the designer, made thick. So it's a really beautiful font. Uh, Looks like we need to do some kerning on that uh, R and Y there. I digress. Next slide. Next typeface we want to talk about is designed by Lin Yun, a really fabulous New York-based graphic designer and typographic designer. And we chose to name it for Etta Shove Hamilton, who was J.E. Hamilton's wife and the company's first bookkeeper. So that was a really exciting project to do. Next slide. And this is the project, the design that Lynn came up with. There are two versions of the Etta typeface, East and West. And uh, you can see our cutting and inking of it in the center there. Next slide. And here you see the uh, pantograph patterns that we work from. Again, cut with a CNC router because of its precision. And we establish the size based on the thinnest stroke of Lynn's font. And uh, we had to use the smallest tracer that we have in the museum in order to get through all of those nice grooves. Next slide. Here you have the West typeface and some experiments about how you could do a secondary color with it. Um, Every one of these projects deserves an hour of discussion. And so I'm having to be uh, very uh, restrained in the, uh, uh, in my uh, discussion of it, but it's really, it was really an ingenious idea. So we've got the Etta West. Next slide, please. And then we've got Etta East. And the Etta East was a distillation of part of the interior of the West letter forms. And they, some of them fit perfectly inside and match it. Or, and then Lynn took it a step further and developed this really beautiful standalone font. Next slide. Our next typeface is called Mardell for Mardell Dubeck. And um, Jim and I and Stephanie here have had always been huge fans of designer Louise Feely. And um, we reached out to her and asked her if she would design a typeface for Mardell. And uh, next slide, please. She came up with a really beautiful futurist um, typeface. Uh, which we, of course, named Mardell. And there you see Mardell working at her pantograph. Let's go to the next slide, please. And the thrill of a lifetime is to have Louise and her husband, Steve Heller, come to the museum to speak at Waze Goose, our annual fall conference, and having her watch Mardell cut a typeface named for her. So being able to have that come full circle Watching the person who it's named for demonstrate her skill was really fabulous. Next slide, please. What I love about this typeface is just the pure geometry and some of the abstraction that uh, Louise employed when creating it. Louise has a number of really well-known books about signage, uh, Art Deco and Art Nouveau signage throughout Europe. And uh, she naturally was drawn to Italian futurist typefaces Mm -hmm. to do this project. Next slide. 
Next project we'll talk about is called Conop, named for Don Conop there on the right. And we asked Mark Simonson, who's uh, based in St. Paul, Minnesota, to create the font for us. And one of the things that Mark was interested in exploring was what kind of freedom would this typeface give a letterpress printer when she or he was uh, printing on press. Next slide. So uh, when we gave the challenge or, or asked Mark to design this face, he about two months later showed me this fantastic sketch, which you see on the left. And then about six months later, we had a finished typeface to cut with. We unveiled this at Waze Goose of 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Next slide. So this is a fun magic square. And one of the things that Mark wanted to do is the W should work as an M, the H should work as an I. And so he wanted everything mounted to be exactly square so that a printer could experiment with it. You wanna show them, a, actually here, let's do this. Got a nice example of the kind of typeface right here. Yeah. Anyway, sorry for that diversion. When the typeface type is laying around, it's just such a, joy to be able to show it off. Uh, next slide. Here you see um, a little bit more digital experimentation about nesting one size of letter inside of another letter, experim experimenting with the rotation of a Z, which becomes an N, and the H is becoming I's. Next slide. Uh, Lustig Elements was an exciting project that uh, designer and and uh, Professor Craig Welsh came to us with. Um, he had been collaborating with Elaine Lustig Cohen on the right there, building a font based on drawings of letter forms that uh, Alvin Lustig had drawn in the 1950s. It was never meant to be a typeface, but Craig really pushed this project forward and approached the museum. And while the person, that, the people who it's named for, Lustig are not Hamilton uh, retirees or employees or volunteers. They both, Alvin and, and, and uh, Elaine, were so instrumental as mid-century graphic designers, type designers, lettering artists, that it was a real joy to add this to the Woodtype Legacy Project. Next slide. So Craig came up with a really ingenious sort of geometric approach based on the letters that Alvin drew. And then he completed it using a grid system because it was so, the geometry was so poor. On the right, you see the capital version and then the small caps version with a little bit lower waistline and then an inline version. Next slide. Here you see the type templates that we used here in the museum to make the freshly cut type with. Next slide. And then the cool thing about this project is Craig was really interested in celebrating the graphic units, the arches, the squares, and the rectangles that make up the font. He then did these fantastic letterpress art posters that you see here. Um, I believe, I don't know if we have these for sale at the museum. They disappeared in so a hurry. Sell out. Sorry to tease you with that, but that's the way we do things here mm. at Hamilton. Mm. Next slide. The uh, last typeface we'll talk about today is done by Juliet Shen. And uh, Juliet is an amazing type designer uh, working on the West Coast, Seattle based, if I'm right, not mistaken. Right. She was actually on the call last week. I hope she's back with us this week. But um, Juliet approached the museum back in, might have been 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. And she had been commissioned by the um, Tulalip tribe. Right. Uh, to create a custom typeface for the tribe that would be based on motifs, nature motifs found in Tulalip and Salish uh, artwork. And Juliet uh, responded brilliantly to this project and came up with a typeface called La Seed. Can we see the next slide, please? So the cool thing about this typeface is that it was used in the tribal school to teach young people and uh, uh, to do as a language preservation process. So rather than learning to write Le Shoot Seed, Le Shoot Seed with a ballpoint pen, we cut type, it, it, was, it was Juliet's idea to have us cut wood type that we would then send off to the tribe that they could use in their tribal schools to print with. And uh, this 
was not only made as a wood type font, but also as a digital font. And um, while uh, Jim is giving a printing demonstration in a few minutes, I'm gonna go back and find the link and then uh, I'll, I'll share that for the group because it's a fantastic project. Working with uh, Juliet was an absolute joy and being able to do language preservation was uh, be a part of a language preservation project was a real thrill. Uh, and then you see the character set in the lower right hand corner. Again, some really, really challenging aspects of this design uh, based on uh, Salish and, and uh, Tulalip art. Next. Well, I was going to say that, you know, there's a number of challenges with this in that there isn't the standard X height that type designers would often be working with. But also the tribe makes this brilliant decision that they will teach the language via letterpress as opposed to computer screen with the thinking that the manipulation of the tools creates a greater sense of retention. And that really spoke to their needs uh, as well as uh, an excellent way of engaging people so that they too could actually move the pieces around to create words in the uh, Lachutzi language. Yep. Next slide. <clears throat> Boxing up wood type and sending it off to a client is always like reverse Christmas. You know, you're you're sending something beautiful to someone and then being able to proof it before it goes and having to assiduously clean off the type so the client is getting nice clean type when they get it is always such a joy. And so here is uh, a lot of type in a box shipped off to um, to the Tulalip tribe. Next slide, please. So that concludes the slideshow portion of it. We've got a little printing demo that we want to take you through. I'll let the team at the Newberry tell us, do you want to, you want us to field any questions or should we proceed with printing? Fine, either way with us. Um, why don't you go ahead and proceed with printing? Can do. All right. Let's go to the printing press. Come into the parlor. <laughs> <clears throat> so Jim's got a really beautiful tiger block on press. This is part of the Inquirer collection. And he is carefully inking up the block as you see here. And I suppose either now or later, you can show them the one behind you on the wall. Yeah, for sure. Let's but, do that now. Um, one thing that I think... This is the tiger that Jim is printing the orange block for right now. You were saying? Well, one thing about the legacy program that is really important to point out, I think, is that the first person we worked with was Matthew Carter. And... He turns out to be this absolutely wonderful guy. And that in itself was great. You know, despite the fact that his typefaces are used around the world, he doesn't say, well, I'll do it if you pay me this much money, or these are my specifications. He was incredibly easy to work with, more ink needed. Um, Anyway, it was so encouraging to, to begin working with someone extremely generous and who really loved the process. So it also gives you a bit of confidence in terms of working with the next person. And Eric was the same way and Marion was the same way and Louise was the same way. So that we aren't working with people who are trying to be proprietary or make money off of it, perhaps they're already okay there. But anyway, I think that the point is it gave us such a confidence to continue working with different designers because they always came forward and said, what do you need? What would you like? And so you get to move on. All right. Um, Jim, we do have a question about the ink that you're using. Yes. Is it is it commercial ink? Is it something you make there? Um, it is commercial ink, and typically when I'm asked what kind of ink I use, the answer is whatever I've been given. Um, 
Now, that said, I do buy commercial oil-based inks when I need specific primaries. Um, so uh, I typically am using oil-based ink all the time. So um, I'm going to be printing uh, color number two. And so the, uh, the block is designed to fit what printers would refer to as a one sheet, 26 by 40. So um, it's a little tricky to handle a large sheet on your own. Um, I've got it. it. It's actually better sometimes with one simply because you never know when the other person is going to tug a little one way or another. This is a great sign press. So it's not designed for quantity. We're not doing 100 on here. But anyway, um, with a 40 by 60 inch bed, it, it's wonderful. So here we go. Thanks for stopping before you got to the laptop, Jim. You're the best. Well, I figured it might help. So um, this has a lot of cross hatching in it, which makes it incredibly tricky in terms of uh, registration, because if the cross hatching is not perfect, um, well, you're going to find out. It's uh, it's like a number of things where if you mess up phase one, you will find out that two, three, and four are only worse. So this tiger, which was used for, uh, I believe, a Carson Barnes poster back in the 50s, is part of the collection. And so these will take a day or two to dry. And then I'll move on to color number three, which is the blue. Uh, to some extent, it will overlap the orange to create the illusion of uh, uh, a yet another color. So if you really want to take a look at this process, the museum's website, uh, woodtype.org, does show progressive proof so that you can look at the process that we use. And so... Um, I'll be, uh, I'll be running about 20 of these. Initially, I'm doing it in terms of, uh, of research um, and with the eventual hope of both learning how good the blocks are, uh, probably uh, selling some in the store if it seems like it's worthwhile. And, uh, you know, it's just a way of kind of um, archiving the collection in a physical way. So. One of the things that Bill had come up with a while back is not just the idea of an online catalog so that you could look at the original poster, but an active way of illustrating what they do. Um, so, you know, in some ways, if you took a picture of a vase and you put it on the museum's website, then you can look at that. But in this situation, what you're also able to do are looking at the pieces that create the final product and the process as well. So we're documenting pretty much every phase of that. And I think I've probably got about, I don't know, another 60 years before I finish, <laughs> but um, so it'll have to be taken over by someone else eventually. But whether it is the type in the collection or the image-based blocks, the idea is to have the physical proofs as well as the printed proofs, because in this case, the collection is in marvelous shape and it gives us such a, such a great way of working. Uh, we could go back to the yeah, table let's go, let's and then back. we'll answer whatever other questions you have, Jill. One of the other things that if time permits, and you guys are okay sh letting, uh, letting me share my screen. I can take you to, um, I can take you to our online gallery where the, the color separation process that Jim just, just, just described is something that we can show um, to your participants if that's okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, would, I would love to see that. I think it's really fascinating because it's so complicated. Um, and while you're doing that, perhaps I can ask you a couple other questions. Um, yeah, yeah. So Jim, we did have somebody else who asked how you know when you have enough ink on the plate. 
Um, it, it, it's really a trial and error process. And it's a very good question because when these posters were originally printed, you had uh, a large press that had perfectly uniform uh, rollers that apply even pressure, and then you can adjust the ink accordingly. But it is very tricky on a cross-hatching nature of, of this type of block because you can fill in the areas so quickly. So I really need to have a light hand and um, if you're running a few hundred of them, you can sort of work your way to that perfect layering. When you're doing it by hand, well, you just have to be more cautious, but I am always really aware of how much um, I might be gaining ink as I brayer each time. And in uh, some cases, because you're attempting to layer blue over yellow to create green, you have to be incredibly light so that those colors uh, work together. Generally speaking, these inks are always opaque when in fact you're nearly attempting to create a transparent effect where one color shows through another. The connection that is important for us as a museum is that Hamilton produced the blocks, shipped them off to these printing companies that they then used to carve these color separations. And so we can find in our company's records where, where, where Hamilton Manufacturing was sending blocks to places like Hatch Showprint in Nashville and Inquirer, print, Inquirer Printing in Cincinnati and other printers large and small around the country. Yeah, even uh, another Chicago company, Barnhart Brothers and Spindler, who would sell anything uh, for the printing trade. Well, if you guys are okay with it, I'll just quickly share my Yeah, story. definitely. And what we're doing is I'm going to you know, throw this URL or, or um, let me, yeah, let me just throw this, this URL in the chat. Okay. It's fairly easy to find on the Hamilton site. Um, uh, if you go to our site, woodtype.org, just click on the menu and you can see online gallery. So the um, what we've been working on for the past two years is the ability to navigate and search various blocks. And so this tiger that Jim was just talking, was just printing with, you can see an image of it here. You can expand it and you are able to see the full finished poster, 26 by 40. Right. Right. So there's the finished poster, but then you can also look at the color separations involved with this. So if you want to see how the yellow print looks, and then you want to add the blue, and then you want to add the red, and then you can add the black, but it gets better. You can also click on a given block to see it closer. And you, uh, we spent a lot of time and worked with our collections manager, Paul Pagnato, who's been an absolute joy to work with, um, to help choose prints, document these prints from the collection. And then you can inspect each of these blocks to see how each of these prints are made. My personal favorite is this thing because the black or the key block for this um, particular poster showcases just some outstanding carving by a guy named John Kerner, who was an employee of, of, uh, of Inquirer Inquire. Printing. And we were able to secure a recording of Harry Anderson, who was the third generation um, third generation owner of Inquirer Printing. But so when you um, when you go to the Hamilton site, we've got maybe 25 posters currently built here where you can examine each of the blocks and appreciate not just how beautiful the printing is, but also experimenting with the layering of color. What happens when you just combine the black and the yellow? And then you can add colors selectively. And what this does for us is it reflects a level of planning and design that it's like 
trying to cut wood type in the style of the 1880s until you try it yourself you don't realize just how good these people were at their craft so there is as i said there's about 20 um 20 posters currently here we'll be adding more to it next year and it's been just such a great way of showcasing um everything from the original reefer madness poster this is 40 inches wide by 52 40 by 78 right. inches tall this is a massive block the original name of the film i believe was the burning question and then they renamed it but here you see it as a two color we've got the black only and then the black and the red combined so if you're looking for sin degradation sex orgies insanity or vice we've got it right here in two ribbon <laughs> um so that wasn't quite the segue i wanted but um talking about well you mentioned craftsmanship and the extremely high level of craftsmanship and even watching the videos of the people who worked at hamilton in the 50s and 60s um we did have a great question about women as type finishers and some there are um um our questioner said she'd seen women um in direct city directories from the late 19th century who did piecework at home type finishers at home and is there some kind of evidence you know you talked at the beginning about someone having his own type his own tools and bringing them in not using your tools is that something that's like a holdover from that um it, it certainly could be i think one of the issues we've always had to deal with at hamilton is the fact that in 1978 the company ceased to be called hamilton and that's because they had grown to a point where they began to be bought and sold and bought and sold. And as their product line became further and further removed from type cutting, um, they began to throw away more and more and more of their records. So while Hamilton, for example, had a specimen book that dates back to their very first year, uh, there are so many within the entire collection that were missing. And when the factory closed in, I think, 2013, they, um, they threw even more things away that we were not privy to. Um, and I think that feeling was, this stuff is all in the past. We are now a wholly different company. And they weren't concerned about it. Uh, that said, we're trying to kind of do the forensic approach toward it. One of the videos that we weren't able to show completely had to do with a woman named Darlene Gilsdorf, who worked at Hamilton. And she talked about being the first woman in the upholstery department. So we aren't in a type related time, but um, sadly, we are missing that information. There is a real interesting. I guess it was originally a photograph we have of all of these employees holding up placards that have a different letter on it. And it said Hollywood type, which means that we know that this is pre, oh, I would say 1891. And what I'm most curious about is in the foreground of all of these maybe dozen or more, maybe 20 employees, there are five women that are seated there that worked in the factory but I don't know where I can go to learn what their jobs were and shed a little bit of light on that situation. So I'm feeling that the bulk of the piecework was always done in the factory. I know that Hamilton was a rather progressive business owner, but that's not very close to answering the question. And I'm afraid at this point, the information is not there. One of the great things is that all of the old journals and ledgers of Hamilton's were uh, scanned and digitized by the UW Wisconsin at Madison Library, and that is online, but they don't have specific employee records. But I can't tell you I've gone through all 80 of those journals either. So um, whether or not that information is to be found yet, I, I wish I could tell you, but I don't know. Um, 
that would be a great project for somebody, I have to say. I think that there's a lot of work to be done there. And whoever's interested, you should email me because I'm interested in that too. Um, a couple of our questions. Um, so we've had questions about how people can learn more about wood type and its history. And also if you guys ever take your show on the road, like do you hire out for parties <laughs> or like, will you come to my house and print our with me? Our mitzvahs uh, are big. Are you Go serious? <laughs> Um, yes. So you can you can learn more about it, uh, not just from the website um, and uh, coming here for a tour or a class, um, but there are an amazing amount of letterpress printers around the country. So in your backyard is actually a Newberry fellow by the name of Jen Farrell. She is a uh, wonderful printer, uh, one of the best uh, in terms of not just printing, but specifically using metal type. And so Star Shaped Press is her business. And that is a great place to look at her work and to, uh, to buy her work as well if you want to. But there are programs at certain schools that are also amazing as well. So um, I know that we've done a lot of work with Indiana University, both in Indianapolis and in Bloomington, where their letterpress program is quite big. And so once you begin delving into the letterpress world, you find that there is everything from MICA, Maryland Institute of Creative Arts, where they too have absorbed a massive collection that they are using and illustrating and teaching about to a lot of places online where you can begin looking at people who do it. Um, Bill and I have taken the show on the road to Seattle and Portland and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Antwerp and- Phoenix, Philadelphia, New York. Venice, Madrid, Mainz, Germany, uh, Montreal. In other words, we we have done it a lot. We are uh, certainly willing to travel, and we're hopeful that that becomes an opportunity again. So we've done everything from um, fill suitcases full of blocks and type, and teach classes at um, places as diverse as Columbia Center for Book and Paper Arts, or the former Harrington. Uh, college in Chicago um, and, uh, you know, giving talks and lectures, uh, certainly things that we've done on a real regular basis. Our hosts were good enough to put our email addresses in the chat section. So don't hesitate to reach out with any additional questions about traveling or anything else we didn't touch on today. Well, and even this conversation um, Jill and the others at the Newberry were kind enough to reach out to us really a year and a half ago about doing this at the Newberry, which would have been so much fun. And I, I really wish we could have, but we will at some point. And we also discussed the idea that if we could get Karen and Sarah and Elizabeth and Jill into the building, get some ink on you guys and do a program here what a perfect world that would be. So we like the flexibility of going there or having you come here. Well, I was going to remind everybody that this was supposed to be an in-person program at the Newberry and that will happen at some point, I can assure you, I, or I hope. Um, so keep your eyes peeled. And um, for those of you who are in the audience and want it, um, let our public programs know that you would like to do this in person <laughs> at some point. Um, and thank you so much. This has been such a fascinating look at, at the craftsmanship of the Midwest. And it's really been so illuminating and entertaining and I cannot thank you guys enough. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Karin momentarily uh, for a moment again. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you both uh, for this fascinating look at the process of creating and printing wood type. Wood type. So amazing and thank you, Jill. Um, and again, our special gratitude to the Paul M. Angel Family Foundation for sponsoring this program. And thanks to all of you for joining us today.
a recording of this program will be available on the Newberry's YouTube channel very soon. Newberry programs remain free and open to the public thanks to the generous support of our donors. During this critical time, we need the support of our entire community, so please consider making a gift today. You can do so online at newberry.org give. We look forward to welcoming visitors back to events at the Newberry, hopefully soon, as soon as it's safe to do so. In the meantime, for our next virtual program, Dr. Jonathan Lear will deliver the final installment of this year's David L. Wagner Distinguished Lectureship for Humanistic Inquiry, Imagining the End, Thoughts on Morning Happiness and Radical Hope. Part three of the series is titled Exemplars and the End of the World. Join us on Zoom, Facebook Live, or YouTube on Wednesday, April 7th at 5 p.m. Central Time. You can register for this and other programs on our website, newberry.org. Thank you.